So good evening everybody and thank you for the invitation to come and talk virtually to Sunderland AS. This is the ABC of Galaxy Evolution. And I'm sure we're all relatively familiar with the sight of a galaxy, whether it be the images that we might get from the Hubble Space Telescope or perhaps in the near future from the James Webb Space Telescope. We've seen lots of interesting galaxies with various types of structure. But the question is, where did all these galaxies come from? And that's what I'm trying to answer this evening. So the ABC starts with A for accretion, meaning that galaxies were formed by matter created in the Big Bang, accreting or accumulating, if you prefer, under the influence of gravity. The B stands for black holes and very large so-called supermassive black holes are at the centres of many, if not all, galaxies. Some of these black holes are very active with matter falling in, generating huge amounts of energy. Some of these black holes are more quiescent, such as the black hole at the centre of our own galaxy. And finally, the C stands for collisions, because in galaxy evolution, Collisions and mergers are the prime method by which galaxies grow and change over their lifetimes, which can be many billions of years. So we're going to look at the A and the B and the C in a little more detail. But where should the story start? Well, like all good stories, it should start at the beginning. In this case, the beginning of everything, the beginning of the universe, 13.8 billion years ago. Now, what we think of as the observable universe, everything that we can now see out to the limits of our observation, which means a distance of some 46 billion light years. So we're talking about a sphere of diameter a little less than 100 billion light years. The universe used to be a lot smaller and we can go back in time, at least notionally, to the time when the universe was not 100 billion light years in diameter but that same volume was much smaller, only the volume of a golf ball. So this was in the very, very, very early stages of the universe, a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang. The universe was about the size of a golf ball. And I like this particular analogy because just like a golf ball, the universe had dimples or at least variations in density, which can be thought of as the dimples in the golf ball. The universe expanded and when it reached a critical size, it turned transparent and released the light that existed in the universe. And that light we see today as the cosmic microwave background. It was originally visible light, but that light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe until the light wavelengths are now a thousand times longer. And that stretches visible light to the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we look at the cosmic microwave background today, in a sense, we're seeing those dimples in the original golf ball. We're seeing those variations in density. And those variations in density, ultimately, when the universe expands further, give rise to individual galaxies and galaxy clusters. So we can ask ourselves, how exactly do we get from A to B? How do we get from the golf ball and the cosmic microwave background, which was the energy released at the very early stages of the universe, early on the scale of billions of years. We're talking about the cosmic microwave background being released at a time period of about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, only a tiny fraction of the first billion years of the universe's history. So from that point to the point we see today, here we see the Hubble Deep Field where we're seeing very large numbers of galaxies. We infer that there must be something like a trillion galaxies in the observable universe. We can ask ourselves how we get from A to B. And the only way we can really make sense of this is to think about simulations. We can ask ourselves about the physics involved in the universe expanding from the size of a golf ball to the size it is today. 
but we can only really make sense and, and realize that the physics that we think we understand, we do understand through simulations. And only in the last 20 years or so have we had computers that are powerful enough to realistically simulate how we take a large amount of matter, let it expand, and then see what structures we end up with. And this little pastiche on the left is a representation of the many, many sets of computer simulations that now exist, now that we have the computing power to run these simulations. I'm not going to be talk talking about all of them. I'm going to be just picking a few images and a few videos from one particular set of simulations. This is known as the illustrious suite of simulations. And I've chosen that just to avoid overloading with too many versions of similar simulations. So we can think about this so-called cosmic golf ball, this object, a sphere, just a few centimeters in size that ultimately will contain everything that we see in the observable universe. And we think we understand how we get from a small volume to a large volume and how we get galaxies because we can run the simulation from these very early times. We don't actually start with the entire observable universe. That's a bit much for any simulation. We start with a small volume, a volume in which we don't fill it uniformly with matter. We deliberately put the matter in with small variations of density because we think they exist in the very early universe. We think they exist because we see them in the cosmic microwave background. And also we need some variations in density for gravity to be able to get a hold. If the universe was perfectly uniform, then it would be impossible for gravity to actually condense some of these denser regions into galaxies. So let's run the first of our simulations on a volume of matter, and let's run that simulation for a few billion years and see what happens if we start with small densities, small density variations and see what happens. It isn't too long before those density variations get magnified by gravity. The denser regions get even more dense. And it's not long before we see this structure, this cosmic web of filaments and voids. And where the filaments intersect with each other, we get the very high density regions. This is where the galaxies and the galaxy clusters are starting to form. So, in a little while, we'll have a closer look at these regions, these little white dots here, where these various filaments meet, and we'll see how it is that the galaxies form in these over-dense regions. So we believe what's actually happening is the matter is flowing down these filaments. The simulations seem to be telling us that when these filaments and voids form, matter flows through the filaments into these regions where the filaments join in a sort of motorway junction, if you like, and that's where the matter starts to accumulate. That's where the proto-galaxies start to form. One thing we must take into account is that if we want a realistic simulation of the formation of galaxies in the universe, we can't just take matter and gravity. We have to take into account that as matter starts to condense, stars will form. And as stars form, they live and they die. And in this particular part of the simulation, these red bubbles that you see there, represent gas being blasted out by stars coming to the end of their lives, black holes or massive stars ending as supernova. That can produce an outward gas blast that actually impedes some of the matter falling in. So gravity is trying to make everything collapse, but the birth of stars along the way can sometimes change the way that that matter falls in to form galaxies. So if we want to have a realistic simulation of what's going on, it's not just matter and gravity. We have to build in the stellar astrophysics that we think we understand about how stars are born, how they live and how they die. But the bottom line is, can any of these simulations explain the sort of diversity of galaxies that we see? 
We haven't mapped all of the galaxies in the observable universe. There will be telescopes coming online, such as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope or the Shimonyi Telescope in the Vera Rubin Observatory. That will be mapping huge numbers of galaxies in the next few years. But even now, when we've mapped a reasonable number of galaxies, we see that they fall into various categories. And if we try and catalogue them here, we notice that there are some gal galaxies over on the left-hand side of this little set of boxes that are more blue. They tend to be disc-shaped and they often have spiral structures. But there's also a large number of galaxies that seem to be more redder in colour and they don't have the same disc shape. They appear to be more like elliptical rugby balls. Can our simulations explain this diversity of galaxy shapes? So we're going to start with accretion and see what our simulations tell us about how matter accretes over billions of years. Firstly, let me say a little bit about the simulations themselves. I've picked the illustrious project as a set of simulations, and these run from the very early universe up to the present day. They have to take into account a number of different factors, not just matter accretion, like in the right-hand box. We have to take into account the fact that the universe appears to be full of a mysterious substance called dark matter as well as all of the hydrogen and helium which we think we understand, born in the Big Bang, must have been a lot of dark matter as well, because at the moment the amount of dark matter in the universe appears to be greater than the amount of ordinary matter. So we have to take that into account in these simulations. And as I've already mentioned in the middle panel there, we have to take into account astrophysical processes such as star formation and star death. And a good simulation would have to account for all of these things in a great deal of detail. That is the principal reason why these calculations could not be performed 25, 35 years ago, but relied on the sort of supercomputers that we've had during this millennium. The illustrious simulations, the original set, ran for 20 million CPU hours. CPU is just central processing unit. Think of it as 20 million computer hours, running between the years 2013 and 2015. When those simulations were complete, the people who coded and ran these simulations looked at them and realised that the simulations could be improved. So they made a little more adjustments to the simulations, made them more sophisticated, took into account more astrophysics in the hope that they would be more realistic. So does this produce Illustris version 2? No, they decided to call it Illustris the next generation. So TNG, I'll use TNG as the abbreviation for Illustris the next generation simulations. So Illustris TNG ran for 200 million CPU hours between the years 2017 and 2019. So you can see that these simulations were complete just a few years ago. And these simulations were carried out on a set of supercomputer, such as this uh, Cray supercomputer here, because if you try and run this code and find out how the universe works using simply an average desktop computer, the program would run for something like 20,000 years before you get the sort of data that we're looking at here. And also I might add that the little link at the bottom of this particular slide, uh, I'll make the slides available to you later if you wish, the link at the bottom of this slide tells you that the TNG project has a web page in which you can find all of the images and all of the videos of which I'm going to show you a small number this evening. So 200 million CPU hours, a very complex code running to try and understand how galaxies behave. The TNG simulations ran on a number of different scales. You can't simulate the entire universe to the sort of detail we would like to look at. So it ran on different scales, 50, 100 and 300 million parsecs, or if you prefer, 150, 300 and 1000 million light years. So the largest box here represents a, a cube of side 300 megaparsec. That's the largest scale that it looked at to try and get an idea of what the large scale structures in the universe look like, to try and understand these filaments and voids and the way matter flows through these filaments. 
But if we want to look at individual galaxies, that's too big a scale to look at. So TNG 50 on the left hand side looks at a much smaller volume in greater detail and that will hopefully allow us to look in detail at how individual galaxies form. And TNG 50 is a sort of intermediate scale to check that everything looks right. A reminder about light years and parsecs. One parsec is uh, about three light years. And as amateur astronomers, we often prefer to think in terms of light years because it's a sensible distance, the distance light travels in a year. But most astrophysicists prefer to use parsecs, so we've got to get used to the idea of using both length scales. To make that a little bit easier, let me just remind you that the Milky Way, being a fairly typical sort of galaxy, its diameter is somewhere of order 150,000 light years, so that's about 50 kiloparsecs. And if we think about the distance between galaxies, the distance from the Milky Way to the Andromeda galaxy, the, um, the nearest neighbour that's a large galaxy rather than small satellite galaxies buzzing around the Milky Way, that distance is about two and a half million light years. So that's a little bit less than a mega parsec. So parsecs are actually sort of quite useful units. One parsec is, the, is comparable to the distance between stars. Our nearest star is four light years away, so parsec is a fairly typical distance between stars. And a megaparsec is fairly typical of the distance between galaxies. So parsecs, stars, megaparsecs, galaxies, a fairly useful set of yardsticks for us to use. So let's look at the first TNG simulation. So here we're looking at one of those blobs I showed you in an earlier slide where different filaments are meeting. So we've got a filament coming in from the top right, a filament coming in from the bottom left, a filament coming in from the bottom right. So let's see what happens as we run this simulation forward for a few billion years and watch the matter streaming in from the filaments. Bright colours represent dense region, darker colours represent less dense regions. You can see it's pretty chaotic in the early stages. Matter is pouring in from all directions and it's not obvious what structure we might end up with, but just like water going down a plug hole, it tends to end up in a sort of circulation type motion and we can start to see the structure of a galaxy forming. We also notice that the colours towards the edges of this particular region are getting darker and darker as more and more material is getting swept up by the object in the middle, which is starting to eat some smaller objects as well. Let me just run that again so we can see the simulation a second time. Matter is falling in from all directions, but chaotically sometimes matter gets ejected from this region. It doesn't all stay put. It's coming in and depending on the velocity with which it comes into this region, it may end up getting lost again. But as more and more matter collects in this region, the gravity is getting stronger. So more and more matter is brought in from the filaments which are joining at this particular point in three dimensional space. And you can see the density is getting higher. The object in the middle of our view here is getting brighter, representing more matter falling into this region of space. And although we haven't necessarily gone all the way to the present day, we can see that there is the hint of spiral arms starting to form in this particular galaxy. But what can the simulations actually do for us? In this particular case, the background, dark on white background, is part of a TNG 300 simulations, the large scale structure, to see what these filaments and voids look like. And if we were to zoom in on certain regions of this particular simulation, we see these uh, four objects here that represent simulated galaxies. And we can ask ourselves, do these simulated galaxies look anything like real galaxies? So we can do that comparison. We can say what sort of galaxies do we actually see when we look out into the universe? And on the left hand side here, I'm showing a number of galaxies that exist according to either um, Hubble Space Telescope or ground-based telescope views. And you can see this pair of colliding galaxies looks quite similar to this simulation. 
This interacting pair of galaxies again bears a passing resemblance to this simulation. And this galaxy here, which looks a little bit more spherical, perhaps a few shells of matter here, again looks not dissimilar to this particular simulation at the bottom. So the simulated galaxies that are produced here do bear some relationship to the galaxies we see in the universe. But if we wanted to really get to the nitty gritty and look at detail, we don't want to zoom in to a TNG 300 simulation. We want to look at the TNG 50, the much smaller scale, more detailed simulations to see what sort of galaxies we can generate in the simulation. And here's a represent representative sample of a number of galaxies that were generated in this TNG 50, this detailed uh, probe of the structures. The left hand side in colour shows us a number of different galaxies and it shows us where the hydrogen is, the yellow being a lot of hydrogen and the purple being less hydrogen. Knowing where the hydrogen is, we can make a guess at where stars will be forming. And the right hand set of panel here are where are the stars, a grayscale image indicating what the galaxy would look like in grayscale. No thought about which particular coloured stars we're looking at, but simply where would the stars be and what would these galaxies actually look like? In each, in each case, in each of these small boxes, we're looking at the galaxy effectively face on, as most of these are spiral galaxies, and underneath is what the galaxy would look like edge on. Most of these are disk galaxies, in other words, a lot of different galaxies will be generated, but for the purposes of illustration, we've simply picked out those that appear to uh, behave like disk galaxies, relatively thin in one dimension, but relatively large in the other two dimensions. So we can get a pretty good idea of how galaxies form, what the hydrogen is doing, and hence how the first stars are going to be producing the light for these galaxies. So knowing that these galaxies are much like we would see in the sky is very reassuring. But of course, one thing that the simulation must be able to do is to generate galaxies that are not totally dissimilar from the galaxy in which we live. If the simulations do not produce a galaxy similar to the Milky Way, then they can't be realistic. And TNG 50 does generate quite a few galaxies with masses of order 100 or 200 or 300 billion stars. And these galaxies do indeed look a lot like the Milky Way, as indicated by this particular example on the right hand side. The face on view shows spiral structure, very similar to the Milky Way. And at the bottom there, the edge uh, view, if you like, shows a very flat disk and it shows a central bulge, again, very much like what we see for our Milky Way galaxy. So if TNG 50 is, gen is capable of generating lots of different galaxies, many of which are disk galaxies and many of which look like the Milky Way, then it does seem like the physics built into these simulations could well be right. Or at least it gives us confidence that we're not doing something horribly wrong when we generate these simulations. Let's have a think about the B of the ABC of galaxy evolution. Supermassive black holes at the centres of galaxies. So when we ask ourselves what is at the heart of a galaxy, quite often it's very difficult to see. So how do we actually know what lies at the centre of a galaxy? Well, we can, using infrared light, cut through some of the dust at the centre of the Milky Way and look at stars orbiting very near the centre. And that tells us something very interesting. It tells us that stars are orbiting very close to the centre of the Milky Way. But when we ask what are those stars orbiting around, well, we can't see anything. There's something invisible but very massive at the centre of the Milky Way. We infer it's a black hole. Over a period of many years, using Earth-based telescopes, star orbits, star positions have been monitored for more than a decade and they are represented here on the left-hand side. The black dot in the centre there is the position of the uh, centre of the galaxy, and these various coloured ellipses show the paths of various stars that were calculated over a period of many years. And by measuring these various ellipses and 
monitoring how long it takes the stars to orbit, we can calculate the mass of the object at the centre, keeping them in orbit, in much the same way that if we know a planet goes around a star in a certain period, at a certain distance, we can calculate the mass of the star. When we do that for this object, we find it has a mass of 4 million solar masses. In this case, this symbol here, capital M, circle dot, is just shorthand for the mass of our Sun. There's nothing special about the mass of our Sun, it's just a more convenient unit than talking about kilograms or tons all the time. So the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way has a mass of 4 million solar masses. And yet it must be very small because these stars are orbiting and if this object wasn't very small some of these stars would collide with it. So we determine that this object must be smaller than our solar system. So very massive, millions of times the mass of the Sun, but very compact, smaller than the solar system. The only object that really fits the bill is a black hole. So we deduce that the Milky Way has a supermassive black hole Hereafter, I'll be using the abbreviation SMBH. So, a 4 million solar mass supermassive black hole. And we've done something similar for other galaxies, and we've been able to infer the mass of the supermassive black holes at the centres of other objects. So Centaurus A, for instance, it's difficult to see in this particular image. The core of the galaxy is too bright to see what's going on, but with some careful analysis of star motions, it's possible to deduce that there is a supermassive black hole at the centre of Centaurus A, which has a mass of 100 million solar masses, considerably heavier than the one in the Milky Way. And we think that that supermassive black hole is responsible for these jets that you can see coming out in the top left, bottom right, from the centre of the galaxy. Black holes can feed on surrounding matter in the sense that anything that gets too close, for instance a passing star, might be disrupted and the matter tries to fall into the black hole. But all of that matter can't go straight down the black, black, uh, the black hole itself. It can't go down the plug hole any more than water can go straight down the plug hole when you unplug a bath. What tends to happen is the matter ends up in an accretion disk circulating around the black hole. And the matter, a lot of the matter, is actually converted into energy. It's a very efficient process for converting matter into energy. It's actually more efficient than using a star to fuse hydrogen into helium. Quite a large fraction of the infalling in matter might be converted into energy. So the accretion disk is very hot and emits a great deal of light across the electromagnetic spectrum. It also might produce jets of particles as indicated in this little illustration here, heading off in the direction of the uh, spin of the black hole. But the mechanics, the, the understanding of exactly what physics is going on to generate these jets of very energetic particles, that is not all understood at the moment. We need to study more black holes to see exactly how that works. But there's one galaxy in particular that has had a bit of attention. Messier 87 or M87 has this small jet coming out of it and that's been known about for some time and if we look at a Hubble picture and look in more detail there's the centre of the galaxy. The galaxy itself fills more than this particular image. The centre is very bright and there appears to be a jet coming out of it. It is thought that there's actually a jet coming out in both directions, but the one that's heading towards us is quite bright and the one that's heading away from us is not so bright. So we see one quite clearly, we can't really see the other one. But M87 was the subject, was the target for the observation by the Event Horizon Telescope, whereby a number of radio telescopes across the world were connected in the sense of data was taken from each of these telescopes and then the data was collated and correlated in order to generate a picture as if a radio telescope the size of the Earth was used. Because the black hole is a very small object compared to the galaxy, you need a very large telescope to be able to get the resolution to image it. And in 2017, 
The data was taken from M87 and it took a couple of years or so to analyze. And then they produced this image of the accretion disk around a black hole. We're not looking at the black hole itself. The black hole is somewhere in the middle of this dark region. There's a shadow in the middle here where light finds it very difficult to reach us. Somewhere in there is the black hole. This is the accretion disk, which is hot enough to generate lots of electromagnetic waves, including the radio waves that were used for this particular observation. It is thought that the supermassive black hole at the center of M87 is some six and a half billion solar masses, absolutely huge. Recent observations, uh, or rather recent analysis of the early observations of this particular supermassive black hole were released a few days ago, and the, uh, the scientists have updated their estimate of the mass of the supermassive black hole, and they think it might be perhaps closer to seven billion rather than six and a half billion solar masses. There's still a little bit of uncertainty there. And as well as imaging the supermassive black hole at the center of M87, they also did the same for the Milky Way and got a similar looking image of the accretion disk. Notice that it's not perfectly uniform. It sort of looks like a donut which is facing us face on. That's probably unlikely. It's more likely at an angle, but part of the matter that's circulating around the black hole is moving towards us, and that looks a little bit brighter than the matter that's moving away from us. And a simulation that gives us an idea of how that works is shown here. The accretion disk seen from above looks like a pancake, but when seen from the side, it gets very distorted by the extreme gravity of the black hole. So although you might expect it to look a little bit like Saturn's rings, it actually gets distorted to the point where we can see the top of the ring and the underneath of the ring at the same time because of the way light is bent as it passes the vicinity of a black hole. And perhaps you notice from this particular simulation, it looks a little bit brighter on the left than it does on the right for the reason I just mentioned, because of the motion of particles going around inside this accretion disk. The black hole at the center of galaxies can produce these jets through mechanisms we don't fully understand. And to show you just how large these jets can be, they aren't simply large on the scale of the black hole itself. They can be large even on the scale of the entire galaxy in which the black hole lives. So for instance, here's an image of Hercules A. This is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in visible light. There's Hercules A, a rather sort of nondescript large elliptical galaxy. And at roughly the same distance, there just happens to be a spiral galaxy just to its south there. And that's quite useful because it's thought that if that's a fairly typical spiral galaxy, it's probably about the size of the Milky Way, give or take a little bit. So Hercules A is an elliptical galaxy which is much larger than the Milky Way itself. But when you think of the supermassive black hole at the center of Hercules A generating jets, which we can't see in visible light, but if we switch to radio waves, we see the effect of those jets coming out of the galaxy. And we realize those jets are absolutely huge. You can see that they are large, even on the scale of the Milky Way galaxy, 10 or 20 times larger than the Milky Way galaxy. And these are being generated by the supermassive black hole at the center. Particles are streaming out at close to the speed of light. And you think if they're traveling through space, what are they doing when they leave the galaxy? Surely there's nothing between the galaxies. Well, there isn't much between the galaxies, but there are still a few atoms floating around out there. And over these sorts of volumes, these jets can slam into this material and produce these shock waves, these plumes, if you like, as the jets get further and further away from the central galaxy, from the central supermassive black hole. So when you see the sorts of scales that are involved, you realize that the supermassive black hole must be generating a huge amount of energy in order to accelerate particles over these enormous distances. 
if a black hole is feeding voraciously, in other words, if a lot of matter is falling into the black hole and generating the energies required, we call this an active galactic nucleus. In order to produce the sort of jets we've just seen, we would describe it as an active galactic nucleus. And the engine, the mechanism, is the infalling matter falling into the black hole, generating the energy required to generate the jets. The most energetic active galactic nuclei are called quasars, and they emit so much radiation that they can be observed even over distances of billions of light years. During the lockdown, I tried to photograph one without using a telescope, just taking a camera and lens. I found a quasar by looking up a reference in a paper and I took an image of this quasar without using a telescope. Perhaps not that impressive, but when you bear in mind that little dot there shown by the two red lines, that quasar is at a distance of about 25 billion light years. And the look back time, in other words, the uh, light left this quasar some 12.4 billion years ago. 90% of the age of the universe, the light has been traveling over the entire expanse of the universe in order to generate that image. If I blow it up a bit more, it's even less spectacular. It's basically just one or two pixels in the camera that have caught the light from this quasar. But when you realize its distance, 25 billion light years, and the light has been traveling for 12 and a half or so, billion years, you realize the energy inside that quasar must be absolutely enormous for it to be visible even without using a telescope. Supermassive black holes have been found in quite a large number of galaxies. It is thought that perhaps they exist in all of them, perhaps there's one or two exceptions, but they are certainly very common. And this particular plot shows the black hole mass on the vertical scale versus the galaxy mass on the horizontal scale. And we see there's a relationship between them. Strictly speaking, this is not the mass of the entire galaxy. This is the mass of the galactic bulge, because that seems to be the relationship of the black hole mass seems to be related to the mass of the central bulge of the galaxy. In the bottom left there, you can see the Milky Way with its black hole of a few million solar masses. And in the top right, there's M87, a much bigger galaxy with a much bigger black hole. So the question is, why are these two related? Why is the size of a black hole related to the size of the galaxy? Which came first? Did black holes form and then galaxies grow around them? Or did galaxies form first and then black holes start to form at the centre of those galaxies, such that now, 13.8 billion years later, we see this relationship between the two? And the answer is we don't really know. We need to study galaxies in the early part of their lives. Studying them now doesn't tell us how these things first came to be. We need to look at galaxies perhaps less than a billion years after the Big Bang. This is one of the things that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to do, look back in time more than 13 billion years to look at the early stars, the first stars and the first galaxies forming to try and answer the question, how did the first stars switch on? How did the first galaxies come to be? And what is the relationship between supermassive black holes and their host galaxies? In other words, we can get an idea from the simulations, but are the simulations right? So we've looked at the A and the B of galaxy evolution. Now let's look at the C. Galaxies grow by collisions. Collisions and mergers are responsible for galaxy evolution. When we look at a beautiful image like this on the left hand side, a static picture can give the false impression that the galaxy is essentially a static structure. Yes, we know they're rotating, but it can take hundreds of millions of years for a galaxy to rotate once. And having rotated once, does it look pretty much the same as when it started? A picture can be deceiving. Over its lifetime, 
galaxies can evolve and change and interact with other galaxies. We can sometimes see that by looking at static images, again a couple of images here taken with a Hubble Space Telescope, sometimes we clearly get the impression that galaxies are interacting with their neighbours, sometimes colliding, sometimes gravitationally interacting with their neighbours and producing tidal tails stretching out from both galaxies. Even if it's obvious that these images show us that galaxies do interact with each other, the influence of how collisions and mergers affect ga galaxy evolution can really only be appreciated not through lots of static images, but through simulations giving us a dynamic picture of how galaxies interact with each other. So let's look at another TNG, a slightly different scale, a larger scale where we see individual galaxies in what I like to think of as a galaxy soup, and you can see some of them interacting with each other. There's a large galaxy coming in from the top and a large galaxy coming in from the bottom. Near the centre of the image now they are just going past each other and now they are gravitationally pulling on each other and now they are merging together to make a larger galaxy. This dictates how galaxies evolve. Galaxies are cannibals, they eat each other. Large galaxies will basically mop up smaller galaxies. Let's just run that simulation again. So we can see a galaxy, large galaxy coming in from the top and a large galaxy coming in from the bottom and in a little while, while they'll meet in the middle. And also you might notice other galaxies interacting, interacting with each other and changing their shape. But one thing these simulations give us an idea about is how many large galaxies can we expect to see? How many small galaxies can we expect to see? If this is a true representation of how galaxies evolve over a few billion years, does our Milky Way look a little bit like this? If we look at the central galaxy, there's one big galaxy surrounded by dozens, if not hundreds, of smaller galaxies. Is that what we see when we look out? Not into the very distant past, but what if we look around us now? What if we look at the local group or the Virgo supercluster that we're in? Do we get that sort of picture? Well, until recently, we thought that the Milky Way was surrounded by perhaps a few dozen small satellite galaxies, which didn't seem to quite fit this simulation because the simulation indicates there should be more than that. There should be hundreds of small galaxies. It turns out the simulations were right and the observations were wrong in the sense that we weren't seeing all of the small galaxies that are out there. Now that we have slightly better telescopes, we realise that there are in fact a lot of faint galaxies out there, small and faint galaxies that are satellites of the Milky Way, and perhaps there are hundreds rather than dozens of them out there. So it gives us some faith that these simulations are telling us about real structures and about how real galaxies do evolve. When we look at galaxy clusters, this is a fairly typical shot of a picture of a galaxy cluster. Notice that a lot of the galaxies are quite orangey, rather redder, elliptical galaxies, and there are a few smaller, rather bluer spiral galaxies dotted around as well. And why is that so common, that when you look at clusters you find a lot of elliptical galaxies, but not necessarily that many spiral galaxies? Well, generally speaking, more crowding, which is what you get in galaxy clusters, more crowding means more likely to have interactions, more likely to have collisions. And colliding spiral galaxies will often strip each other's spiral arms and merge together into an elliptical structure. So in that sense, it's no surprise to find that crowded galaxy clusters often comprise elliptical galaxies rather than spiral galaxies. We think that's going to happen with the Milky Way and Andromeda. This is not a huge galaxy cluster, but just a couple of nearby galaxies. They are close enough that they are gravitationally pulling on each other. And we think that Andromeda is heading towards the Milky Way. We're not sure if it's going to be a head-on collision or not, but it does look like in a few billion years Andromeda is going to collide with the Milky Way. Triangulum is also in this picture, but it's thought that Triangulum is just going to be an onlooker. This particular simulation runs over a few billion years and shows us what happens when one spiral galaxy collides with another.
As they get close to each other, they start to gravitationally attract each other and they will effectively pass through each other. So there's the collision point. Stars are not likely to hit each other, but the gravity of one is going to disrupt the gravity of the other and the spiral arms are going to start to disintegrate. And then they pass through each other a second time and then a third time and then over another billion years or so, this new galaxy settles down into a sort of elliptical structure. So as far as we can tell, spiral galaxies in collision will probably result in elliptical galaxies. So when we look at different galaxies in the universe, we can get an idea of how they must have interacted in the past. What it'll look like from our point of view, well, somebody has generated a few stills just to give you an impression of what it might look like. If the Earth survives long enough to see this, this is what we're seeing at the moment. Of course, we're seeing the Milky Way from the inside, the stripe of stars going from top to bottom, and there's the Andromeda galaxy as a small smudge just top left of centre. But if we run the clock forward in a billion years or so, the Andromeda galaxy will be much closer. An absolutely fantastic target for astrophotographers if they're still around in a billion years time. If we go to three and a half billion years or so, the Andromeda galaxy is now so large it fills half of our sky. And the outer parts of both galaxies will now be disrupting each other. If, if we move forward a few hundred million years, then at this point the galaxies are now starting to move through each other. Stars are probably not going to collide with each other. Planets are not necessarily going to be disrupted but the gas in one galaxy is going to smash into the gas of another and all of the hydrogen clouds in the two galaxies are going to be disrupted and there's going to be a massive change to the rate of star formation. And by the time we get to a little less than four billion years into the future, there is going to be star formation absolutely everywhere as these two galaxies pass through each other go on another 100 million years, they will essentially pass through each other. It'll be impossible to say which star originally belonged to the Milky Way and which star originally belonged to Andromeda, but there will be a tendency for Andromeda to pass through the Milky Way, which is now very disrupted, and we've lost the spiral arms of the Andromeda galaxy as well. But in a little while, the two galaxies will come back together, as we saw in that earlier simulation, and start to form a very large elliptical galaxy. Here we see that the two nuclei haven't yet fused together. It appears that there's one brightish nucleus over here and another brightish nucleus over there. So the galaxy has fused with Andromeda, but the two supermassive black holes are still separate. Given long enough, those supermassive black holes will also coalesce into one. What do we call this new galaxy? Well, is it going to be still called Milky Way slash Andromeda? Are we going to call it Milkdromeda? Are we going to call it Andrilki or Andrilway? It doesn't matter. We've got five billion years to figure out the new name of this galaxy. But ultimately, if we wait long enough, those two black holes are going to merge together and there's going to be so much material around, disrupted by the collision, that that new black hole will almost certainly be feeding voraciously on all the material around it. So it is possible that this new galaxy will actually form a quasar. It is possible that this new galaxy will have a nucleus so active that it could be labelled as a quasar. So remember, at the moment, we can see a quasar without a telescope, even on the other side of the observable universe. If our galaxy ends up with a quasar at its core, that could be very bad news if we are still around and if we are still trying to survive. Having a quasar so close um, could indeed be a problem regarding the total amount of radiation it will be producing. But that, of course, is pure speculation. So I've been telling you about the ABC of galaxy evolution. A for accretion, that's how galaxies were formed, accretion or accumulation of matter after the Big Bang. Black holes are at the centre of every galaxy. Some are very active and feeding and producing active galactic nuclei or quasars. 
Some, like the one at the centre of the Milky Way at the moment, is very quiescent. Very little matter is falling in, very little energy is being released. And finally, the C of the ABC is collisions. Galaxies grow by collisions and mergers of other galaxies as one big galaxy tends to cannibalise any smaller galaxies in its neighbourhood. And that continues over many billions of years and we assume will continue many billions of years into the future. So next time you look at a galaxy, whether it be a beautiful image in a magazine, on the web, or perhaps even a little fuzzy blob in a telescope, remember how that telescope, excuse me, remember how that galaxy came to be. Remember the ABC. Thank you all for listening.